and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, better known in some places as the Wanderer. And the creator of the upcoming campaign setting, Lugan, the, Gra the Grand Cross of Four. The one and only Mark Evgars. I know I fucked it up. My apologies. And no problem. <laughs> How are you doing today, man? Yeah. Or tonight? I am case. doing great. And by your intro, I'm already wondering what the hell I wandered into. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to prove to be, uh, to be a fun little conversation. Already looking forward to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, it's tradition around here for me to start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh. Well, we gotta go back a long time. To the pristine year of 2006. <laughs> mm -hmm. Long story short, started at high school basically, with D&D uh, 3.5, the starter set back then. Played with my friends, screwed up. Uh, over time, we noticed what we did wrong, and then uh, spread out to other systems, always deb kept dabbling in the new D&D versions, though. Um, until a couple of years ago, um, Lugon wasn't always a Kickstarter. It, it sure as hell didn't really start as one. Um, basically, it was my home game for about two to three years. Um, and I crafted a lot, of, uh, a lot of things for it. I crafted this world that basically had as a basis uh, combining magic and biology, then mm -hmm. evolution and ecology. Uh, in specific, so really build everything from the ground up. And it got a little bit out of hand. And yeah, two and a half years down the line, my group said, so, uh, Mark, you've got, you've got a book laying there, like literally. Shouldn't you like do something with it? Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, you know, let's try. Um... That's basically where uh, where the project took flight. Uh, got a, quite a lot of artists involved. Uh, got a lot of help. <clears throat> and uh, now we're running. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll grab our goal. And uh, the TTRPG world will be one rich setting richer. Mm -hmm. So... With that, with that in mind, the the idea of 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 mixing biology and and fantasy, um, how did was that was that something that you just you just wanted to do given your given your field and your love for fantasy and it just kind of it just kind of happened to mix that way or was yeah. there a cer was there a certain idea that sp that sparked it? Uh, a little bit of both, actually. Like, I am a biologist at heart, and specifically an entomologist, so uh, somebody that researches insects. Uh, um, recently, I've also gone into teaching. I'm a, Currently, I'm a high school biology teacher, mm -hmm. getting people ready for uni. And uh, so, yeah, that is like the getting that information on paper, teaching people, getting people hyped. That is kind of a passion of mine, which funnels greatly into, like, the TTRPD space. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why I took the approach I did was that I, I saw that a lot of settings and a lot of creatures within those settings, fancy settings, mm -hmm. they don't really make sense if you look at them in a biological, like, way sense. They uh, have some kind of discrepancies a lot of the time. 
So I was like, you know, let's <laughs> put my knowledge to good use. Uh, let's get some people involved. Let's get some uh, let's get some discussions going, and let's see if we can build a setting where that is less the case. Mm-hmm. Which started as a like a pet project just for a house game, and ended up uh, ended up as a uh, for now 250 page player handbook and 250 page player GM guide. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's kind of the uh, the origin of the Lugan project. Yep. Now, taking now taking that into into a into account mm-hmm. with oh, since you given that background with in with um insects, um, yeah. I'm get I'm guessing that I'm guessing that you have a handful of races that are going to kind of reflect that. It's it says on the Kickstarter page you have four natural races and three hybrids. Um, well, the uh, I've got one insect race mm-hmm. that's um, like called the Iruk. Uh, like all the uh, all the races also have that same background, so they are all uh, you you have the natural races, which are the races that occurred naturally within the world, which who are not as fantastical. As, for example, the race that I'm going to talk about next. But think of your uh, your humans. Uh, then we have the Lon, who are basically your uh, yeah your mountain dwellers. They dwell on like mountain slopes. Turns out, by the way, that being small, like a uh, like a dwarf or a gnome, actually is a great boon when living uh, in the mountains. So they got that one. They got that one right. Uh, <clears throat> And two other natural races uh, called the Visari and the Jeet, who are forest dwellers and plain dwellers, respectively. One, uh, the plain dwellers are taller, so they can look over the grass, and the forest dwellers have some uh, longer, uh, longer arms, longer legs, and are very slim, slender, quick to be able to move through the woods. So you don't have your elves, you don't have like your standard races well except human i guess then we have the hybrid races and the hybrid races are races that have been touched by magic that have adapted to their environment um, with that magical influence Mm -hmm. so think that the insect folk the iruk uh, they are part of that for example and I, I took I took a little bit of comic inspiration with them. They basically have a sort of spider sense. They can uh, detect traps. They have uh, some limited tremor sense. Shenanigans going on. That kind of thing. Uh, and of course, natural armor because chitin. They are still mostly humanoid in appearance, though. So no trickreen full insect uh, shenanigans. They still have hands. They do have. Slight mandibles and such, but they are a little bit more to the human slash humanoid side of things. And all the hybrid races are derivative of one of the natural races and are an evolution of that natural race. So, for example, you have the humans that changed uh, to be able to see in the dark better and got bad like traits, for example, including the wings. Uh, or um, very specifically adapted to mangroves and adapted to being able to breathe on the water and even with flying fish fins to be able to glide uh, through the air for short uh, short distances. That kind of thing. Oh. So that's a little bit how the races in Lugon are, uh, yeah, are presented. All right. And speaking of, speaking of that, since magic is t- is tied to biology as one, as one of the main pillars of Lugon, mm-hmm. I'd l- I'd like to go into how into how that works and the, for lack of a better term, the magic system that is going to be present. Sure. So uh, in Lugon, magic is basically a substance. 
uh, it permeates everything. Uh, the whole world, like the building blocks, just as we have electrons, atoms, etc. Uh, those are already somewhat similar to magic, if you ask me. Like the, the, how electrons work and such is just alien. They can even make light. So, you know, uh, what we have in the real world is already somewhat magic. But, uh, yeah, magic and Lugon are the... Like the, the building blocks which the world is uh, built of. And raw magic, so magic that hasn't been shifted into other matter, is basically the energy that fuels uh, both magical casting abilities, uh, the abilities of creatures to do magical stuff, etc. Um, so basically, what you have is both the physical and the somewhat spiritual are uh, created out of magic so everybody has their own soul what you do with that magic uh, the magic is everywhere around you you pull that in your soul acting like somewhat of a mold and it comes out in a shape you desire on the other end be careful not to uh, pull in too much magic dough because then you rip your soul to pieces which isn't a Terribly pleasant experience. Probably not. Nope. Now, within now within it mentioned you mentioned that you have four base classes that you're going to be working with. Yep. Um, I'd like to go. I'd like to go through those four classes to kind of get a feel for what they would be contributing to the sandbox, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. Starting with the goal of frost flame. Yeah. So. Uh, a little bit of base information for like the uh, like the class in general. They have uh, adapted uh, with one situation in mind. What if there is too much magic for normal casting to work? So, for example, you can't just pull out a ninth level spell uh, out of your back pocket due to overloading yourself. So you have to somehow take your time and. Um, how do you call it? Uh, negate the impact. So, going to the Gowler Frost Flame, they do that by slowly ramping up their power. Their casting system is called Chain Magic. And Gowlers of Frost Flame embody destruction. What they do is they uh, start with like a, a cantrip like spell. Their uh, Ash and Frost burst. And every time they cast a uh, spell in sequence, they get uh, bonuses, get stronger, etc. Until they've gathered enough momentum to be able to harness that uh, strong flow of magic and, uh, well, start uh, tearing up the place, basically. Mm -hmm. So a Gowler you would play if... For example, Phoenix Sorcerer and such is your preferred playstyle. Mm -hmm. Although it is a little bit more tactical, you can get more mileage out of it, out of the Gowler, damage-wise. However, it does require some planning. That's uh, that's basically how they how they work. And every uh, every one of those four classes embody a other aspect that you need for like a setting to exist. So Gowlers are destruction, spell guys are creation, uh, disciples of anima are order, and then you have the Kezo monsters that are chaos. Because you need to create stuff. Uh, however, without destruction, the world would just be full with all kinds of stuff. With, and nothing would go away, which would be bad. Uh, think, for example, too much creation uh, in uh, terms that uh, we have in our world would be, for example, cancerous, that kind of thing. Um, destruction, well, too much destruction, kind of obvious what kind of problem that brings with it, um, because there would be nothing left. Um, too much order would result in things being too stagnant. And nothing changing, so yep. all the good would stay the same, but also all the bad. And chaos would be everything changes, 
the good and the bad. And like a combination of all four forces would allow a healthy and prosperous setting, basically. Mm -hmm. So, which class do you want to talk about next? All right, next, the spell guide. Spell guide creation. Uh, spell guides are a uh, very supportive class. They don't really have an offensive presence on their own. However, they have utility and buffs for days. Uh, from a lot of uh, scrying spells and such to the ability to uh, just give huge buffs to allies when uh, given the right opening. How um, spell guides work is basically um, to, to combat that stress of casting, they put three uh, or four small buffs on allies. And when those buffs are on there, they have gathered some momentum and then they can use it that momentum to cast one big buff using the uh, the beacons as guidance, basically. Mm -hmm. So you buff an an you buff an ally, and you use those small buffs to be able to cast like a big uh, your your big boost uh, mm -hmm. onto that ally, for example. Uh, which was why it's called beacon magic. Mm -hmm. And those big buffs, um, you uh, like it, it takes you a while to get those on. Uh, however, um, as buffs go, think of like big temporary health buffs, uh, forced critical hits are there, uh, which under the right circumstances, I mean, look at a rogue with sneak attack can be very, uh, very rewarding to pull off. Uh, one small thing, though, that's not infinite, so you cannot like let everybody crit all the time. Fortunately, otherwise that would be uh, more than a little bit, bro. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, those kind of buffs are uh, yeah are able to be distributed, and they have a lot of healing options mm -hmm. as well. So they're a little bit of the healers of the uh, of the setting. So, next one I'd want to ask about is the Disciple of Anima, which, just the name alone, get, I can make a few assumptions, but you know what they say about assumptions. Well, do, do, do tell me your assumptions, because now you're making me curious. Um, it mostly has to, my assumption mainly has to do with, the, with what the word Anima means. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. And, Specifically, specifically the um, the now I'm go I'm going to try my best to summarize this because we're because this is dealing with Jungian psychology and that's not easy to summarize. Mm -hmm. But it is usually some some form of in, some form of inner self or or um soul and mm -hmm. one that's in con one that's in touch with the unconscious. Oh yes, I am Disciples. vastly simplifying things. Oh yeah. Well, uh, long story short, the disciple of Anima uses a type of magic. They constitute order, mm -hmm. which uh, means uh, your uh, little monk temple here should like them very much, <laughs> because they also get an arm strike and all kinds of monk things. Mm -hmm. And they uh, use a type of magic called soul magic. So oh, yeah, you were right on the money on that one. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I basically, I, yeah. I figured it was going to be something like that. It was just more of how it was going to manifest. <laughs> uh, yeah. So what the disciple of Anima can do is they can basically not only influence their own soul but also those of others. Uh, they have the ability to crystallize the souls of enemies they defeat in so-called anima gems and use those to either power their magic or uh, get other buffs, etc. How they use their magic? Um, they basically uh, can cast uh, spells a little bit more traditionally. However, 
Um, what they have done is not chosen for a build-up approach to spell casting, but more like okay, we're gonna fortify the heck out of our uh, out of our soul, which did come at the cost of flexibility. The disciple of Anima has mantras, uh, which are sort of stances that they stand that they like assume. And when, for example, in the judgment, the judgment mantra, you can only cast judgment spells. When in the atonement mantra, you can only mm -hmm. cast atonement spells. Mm -hmm. And switching mantras does take uh, time. Um, at the start, it takes a full round action, for example. Mm -hmm. So you are limited in flexibility unless you want to... Uh, yeah, spend a turn switching out mantras. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there are like uh, probably one of the more tactical ones. Mm -hmm. However, to uh, offset that, they have a higher hit die, they have unarmed strike, and they can use their anima gems to empower their attacks, for example. So they can also roll uh, if the need arises until they get an opening, for example, to switch uh, mantras. Mm -hmm. So they're a bit more like I felt not all casters need to be these like squishy roped mages. No, let's just get a full caster with a little bit of like knuckle grease involved. That'd be fun. So yeah, those are uh, that's the disciple of Anaman in a nutshell. Yeah. So uh, the next the next one that I wanted to ask on is. The um, Delirianist. I'm hoping I got that pronounced right. Yeah. Uh, the Delirianist, uh, we had a little name change mm -hmm. uh, to Kezomancer. Uh, just because, like, the first iteration of the Delirianist uh, kind of went into the themes of uh, chaotic madness. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought it, it would be best to tone that down a little bit, allow people to go that direction if they so chose, but not actually uh, force people into that role. Mm -hmm. So we uh, renamed him the, uh, we named them the Keso Monster, which are basically your, uh, yeah, your the, the experimenters like, okay, you know, we're gonna experiment and we're gonna see what sticks. So they uh, have a really odd approach to spellcasting. Every day they wake up and think, okay, how am I going to solve my magic problem today? Okay, you know, I'm going to experiment with, I'm just going to cast spells and see what it does. Mm -hmm. So what they have is they have a number of spell slots that you can use to cast. A little bit like the Warlock, you can cast all your levels of spells. Um, you do have a, uh, quite a bunch of those spell slots. However, the first 50% of those spell slots, for example, you have nine spell slots. So for the four, first four spells, you uh, actually get like penalties because you're still experimenting. Mm -hmm. However, at some point, you get the hang of it and your other spell slots for the rest of the day are uh, you're able to cast stronger spells with them and you no longer get those penalties. So it really comes down to like a balance of sorts. So with the Kezo monster, it is like, okay, I could just blow through my first couple of spell slots, have less spell slots, but don't deal with those uh, debuffs. Mm -hmm. Or I can save them uh deal with those debuffs and for example put them in areas that don't impact me for example they can get uh, like penalties on perception and such if you're not a perception based character uh it doesn't really matter if you have like a uh, wisdom well you know wisdom wisdom rogue with expertise on uh on perception mm -hmm. i don't know someone else. that yeah why would you need a good perception so you can put those penalties there, uh, or you can just say in a pinch, like, okay, sure, 
uh, at the start of the day, I need to be at my best immediately. I need that stronger magic. I'm just going to uh, put my buffs on myself, my low-level buffs, get those few spell slots, a uh, few low-level spell slots uh, out of the way, and then supercharge my magic for like the other 50%. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the uh, the the thing that the uh, Caves of Mons has to worry about. Yeah. Now, when it comes to <coughs> some of some of the um, subsystems that you're that you're putting in, the one oh, yeah. that I that I was that I was the most curious about is Lugani's alchemy. Oh, Lugani's alchemy! Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> okay. So basically, uh, Lugami's Alchemy is a uh, a subsystem mm -hmm. of basically alchemy, alchemical uh, recipes and items. Because well, there are not really a lot of like good alchemical systems in, for example, D and D and Pathfinder. So what Lugami's Alchemy adds are uh, like a whole list of recipes. Also, a lot of uh, like different ingredients, common or rare. And you can basically experiment. So you have your alchemical system. You're like, you know what? I've got these ingredients. Uh, what happens if I put them together? Mm -hmm. And you run an experiment, like a proper alchemist should. And then it either fails or succeeds, depending on your skill check. And the uh, the uh, combination of ingredients chosen. If you get it wrong, no worries. Uh, you'll get a like a minor, mostly comical effect. For example, your face goes black for two days because it goes, you know, blows up in your face. However, you do get hints from the DM, like okay, so you put in these three uh, ingredients. These two together are part of a recipe. Although that one, you had wrong. So a little bit more like mastermind-ish. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also make, uh, they, they are in the Game Master Manual. And uh, of course, if you know the recipe, one game, you the DM probably has to uh, switch the recipes up next game if you want to keep it fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, which is totally possible. There are enough ingredients to keep going. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, you can just experiment, and there are different tiers as well. So common, advanced, and dangerous tier of chemicals, mm -hmm. uh, which can even sometimes provide uh, uh, permanent buffs to a character. So basically, they uh, you create an item that's basically a magic item mm -hmm. that you can give a character that they gulp. Think super soldier serum, but then uh, probably somewhat less impactful. Mm -hmm. uh, given that, given that setup with combinations, do you have plans mm -hmm. for having a particular a um, sheet for the GM so that he so that he can track combinations? Yeah, they uh, the alchemy. Um, they, they, we have like a couple of pages uh, planned that have like tables uh, with like the names of the recipe. And then, like, uh, the ingredients above, and then, like, this neat little chart. Like, okay, mm -hmm. this recipe has this, this, and this ingredient, this, this, and this ingredient. Yeah. So you can have a quick overview of what is needed. Yeah, but it doesn't It doesn't sound like one... It doesn't sound like there's as much propensity for random explosions as there might be in other forms of alchemy. Uh, depends. Uh, you can also craft grenades, and if crafting a grenade goes wrong, well, you can bet that it goes boom. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's not like the pe people don't really like the whole fireball on self, like for example, the wild sorcerer has, but things can go boom, things can break. Uh, you roll on the d100 table when things go wrong, mm -hmm. however. Uh, there are certain countermeasures you can take to um, actually, you know, lessen the chance that something goes horribly wrong. Uh, so if you use an alchemy lab, 
uh, use gloves, uh, like protective equipment, etc., you uh, get a, a penalty on that D100 roll because the higher you roll, the worse it is. And uh, so the more protective measures you take, the less chances you'll have that it actually goes boom. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, the wide explosions are in the more upper regions of uh, alchemy going wrong. So on, yeah. on the upper regions of that D100 table. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, mm -hmm. given the given the name it, given the full name it has the term the Grand Cross of Four. Yeah, I'm assuming that I'm assuming that is going to refer to the four the four pillars of of the magic system within the game. Uh, bingo. So the Grand Cross of Four is basically the four. Uh, can I can uh, point to two things in in universe? Either the four kinds of magic, so destruction, uh, so, so chain magic for destruction, beacon magic for creation, soul magic for order, flux magic for chaos, or the four A-Rolls, which are basically your divine beings in this setting. They work slightly in, in slight other ways when compared to other like more traditional D&D gods. Mm -hmm. But you have an A-Roll of destruction, A-Roll of creation, A-Roll of order, A-Roll of chaos. And those also make up the Grand Cross of four. Yeah. Now, with that, with that in mind, given, given the way magic is a substance, are you still using the spells per day model with the, with the classes that are meant, that are meant to complement this system? Uh, yeah, they still have spell slots. They still have spells per day. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. The Kesomancer has... Like, they all work in slightly different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, they do have their spells per day. However, they do also have, uh, like, cantrips or utility spells in place mm -hmm. so that they're not sitting ducks and boring to play when you run out of those spell slots. Mm-hmm. Now, you won't find yourself just like throwing like toll the deads everywhere as soon mm -hmm. as you run out of spells which is de which is definitely good to hear mm -hmm. now with that with that in mind yeah. given how it, given how from from what I'm seeing with the with the art as well as some of the other materials there's definitely a heavy emphasis on wilderness um could mm -hmm. Lugon be run as a hex crawl? Yeah, it uh, certainly could. There are uh, like uh, one of the focuses of the uh, the setting is ecology. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, is of course ecology and evolution, which means that environment plays a huge role. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have all of these like environments that you can use from. Uh, which all have their own monsters. Uh, you can make it as deep as you want, um, because well, I'm I'm not the only one that knows biology that's on the team. Uh, you can actually dive if you are interested in that kind of thing. You can dive very deep into it, like build, like have your own like interactions that are very scientifically appropriate, or you can just keep it simple. But uh, there are a lot of Lugon specific monsters. There are a lot of uh, a lot of areas that you can explore. Mm. Um, we're also planning uh, environmental like hazards and effects that you can throw at your players. Uh, so yeah, no Lugon could be definitely be uh, be run as a hex crawl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now the given give now going further into the whole thing of of flora and fauna as well as mm -hmm. how mat how magic can affect it is yeah. it possible that in in certain in certain parts the way that magic affects the na the natural area could be could be a little bit more drastic than others oh yes um let me give you a little bit of history on the setting itself so um the setting was like the, the world itself was built by the Aral of Magic, mm -hmm. Rudol, that's shaped like uh, at the start, there was only magic. 
the magic coalesced and changed millions of years later, the first consciousness, the first soul, uh, came into existence. Well, that was the prime Aral, so the Aral of magic, the one that started everything off. Mm. He made the four of the Grand Cross of Four, and all of them combined made the setting. Um, and... Wait, hold on. Could you repeat the question again? Oh, I, I lost can, track of my whole story. Can the can the can the effect of magic on the flora and fauna be a bit more drastic in, cer in oh. certain places? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I know what I was talking about. Cool. <laughs> okay. So at first, uh, when the world was created by those uh, by those five, the um, the the like the remaining magic was locked up underneath in like uh, underneath the earth with only one access point uh, so it could like be controlled and flow into the world to be used well that went wrong that thing exploded mm -hmm. allowing the magic to flood uh, the entire center of the continent which left a literal sea of magic the arcane sea in the middle of that landmass mm -hmm. So, uh, and liquid magic in vast quantities, think, uh, if you want to have an analogy on the environment, think radiation. But then, like, uh, even, probably, probably more, like, yeah, no, no, just as lethal in high doses. So, you have, like, a radius around the arcane sea that is, like, almost completely dead. Nothing can survive there. The concentration is just too high. And that's called the night of life. Mm -hmm. And only the flow, which are uh, elementals made out of pure magic, can survive there. So only very specific life forms can survive there. Uh, players would need very special protection to venture into that uh, area. And I'm guessing that protection has its limits. Oh, yes. Uh, you cannot... The, it is like a desolate land. Nobody has ever uh, succeeded. Even uh, higher level adventurers and like configures to be able to survive there for like longer periods of time. You probably have two weeks at the most. Mm -hmm. So two it's weeks getting in and getting out. Yup. Indeed. Uh, they have like that. One of the reasons why you would go in. Like, ancient ruins and such are still there, which are literally millennia upon millennia old and highly unreachable. So there's a lot of loot for the taking. Mm. And you know how loot affects adventurers. You know, yep. magnetism. <laughs> but yeah, okay, so we have the Night of Life. Well, mm. the magic, uh, the effect of magic begins to dwindle the farther you get from the Arcane Sea. Mm -hmm. So at some point, it gets mild enough for life to adapt and then you get into the dusk of life mm -hmm. the dusk of life is where the magic is strong enough to have an influence but not strong enough to kill this is the region where the hybrids came into being so the uh, the natural races that were caught in the dusk they were the ones that adapted uh, like evolved to be able to use that magic to their own advantage and <clears throat> that's where the uh, yeah the hybrid uh, races came from. Like there are, we have four in the project. Uh, there are uh, three more that are planned uh, if we get far enough mm -hmm. into the project. And um, I, I hmm? can I can certainly get that now. Yep. With that, in, with that in mind, yeah, I know, th I know that you had that you had mentioned that you're going to be doing, you're going to be adding on a um, a one sh a one shot adventure. Um, oh yeah. Do you do you have plans on do on doing a sh short adventure within the full book? Oh yes, uh, the uh, the one shot adventure is already uh, grabbable on the Kickstarter itself at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically the starting point of uh yeah of the the story 
that will be partially told in uh, in the book itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one shot only covers level one. The adventure, uh, we do have to see what the level range is going to be, but it will probably be uh, quite, uh, yeah, the, quite quite a few levels mm-hmm. of content that uh, you can like to to give people also a nice little uh, nice little taste of what Lugon can offer. All right, I can get that. Now I know you're planning on two bo- on two books. What are you shooting for as yeah. far as the page count for the? Um, player-facing book and the GM-facing book? Uh, let's see. At the moment, we're shooting for between the 200 and 250 pages for each book. And uh, depending on... Um, well, depending on how much we can get away with, mm-hmm. 300. Because we do have enough content to like push them both to 300, but it shouldn't be bloated it should be like uh it, it it should be like easy and uh nice to read through mm-hmm. uh but we uh we do have more than enough content to like have two hundreds of pages uh book for both the gm and the players as well mm-hmm now, what are you shooting for as far as a release window for the project? Not a date, per se, but a general okay. ballpark. Uh, let's see. Um, if everything goes right, we'll hit our goal somewhere this month. Uh, after that, we've given ourselves about a year to uh, to get things going. Hire uh, editors. More art. So much art. It's going to be great. And uh, like yeah, get the uh, get the book out. So about uh, yeah, about in a year's time, give or take. All right, all right, I can get I can get behind that. And I will be looking forward to seeing how it how it develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto my show and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Oh no problem. Enjoyed the madness very much. And thank you for. Thank you, too. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I mean, I'm sitting here with, like, tea and a beer, so I think I got that one covered. <laughs> and, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!